Well, I want to welcome you guys. If I haven't got a chance to meet you yet, my name is Kyle Brownlee. I serve as the lead pastor here at Experience Church, and we're just honored to have everyone in the house today. Also want to look into the camera as I do every single week and welcome all those joining us for church online, in living rooms, nursing homes, throughout our community, uh, in other states, even other countries. Come on, Lima, Peru is in the house today. Uh, Belize is in the house today. Israel, Jerusalem's in the house today. Come on. We are, are so excited to have you guys with us. And I want to give a special shout out to all the men and women joining us from the Correction Center of Northwest Ohio. We absolutely love you guys. Come on, D-Town, and we welcome our church family today. So good, so good. Well, um, today I just have, uh, it's, it's my honor and my privilege um, to announce to you that uh, um, someone that I just um, I hold very dearly to my heart is gonna be bringing the message to us today, and um, I was just thinking about, um, I was thinking about Aaron Rosario today, and how proud of him um, I am, and I've seen this man just grow as a leader, as a man of God, and over these years, and and if I could just say something, I I believe that Aaron is just a son of the house, and um, that God has brought him here, and I am, I'm just so proud of him because there's a call of God on his life. And not, not just to lead us in worship around here, but also um, to preach the truth of God's word. And so I, I won't say any more because I could keep on going, and I don't want to get all choked up before he preaches. But I want you to know um, how much love and respect um, that I have for Aaron, who's getting ready to bring the word of God to us today. So I want to I want to challenge us to posture our hearts before heaven to receive what God wants to speak to us today through the truth of His word. Can I get an amen? So could you just help me welcome Aaron Rosario to the stage today? Love you, man. Amen. Well, I'm excited to be here today, church, uh, if you can't tell, you know, <laughs> I'm excited to be here and it's a, an extreme honor and privilege. I, I mean, I just, I'm so thankful for our pastors. Is anybody else thankful our pastors here at Experience Church? for their heart, for the vision that God's given them. So thank you, Pastor Kyle. It's an honor and a privilege to be here today. And so what I want to do is I'm just going to, to jump in. The title of my message today is I Choose Jesus Over Everything. The title is Jesus Over Everything. So if you would look to somebody next to you and tell them, I choose Jesus, I choose Jesus. over everything. Now look to another person around you somewhere and with a little bit of conversation, you need Jesus <laughs> over everything. I'm only playing kind of a little bit. So as, as I was growing up, um, I, I grew up in a, a Christian household and my parents were praise and worship leaders before I was even born. And so I grew up into this family. I was born into this family who put Jesus over everything. And that was the standard in the household. And so I came to realize that for our family, it had to be Jesus over everything. In every situation, in every circumstance, that we would search out Jesus for every answer. Now, the thing about that was, I I grew up in this house and I knew what was right, but I didn't come to that full realization in my own heart until about 19 years old. I was close to 19 and I struggled with a lot of insecurities. I struggled with a lot of racial tensions. I struggled with alcoholism. I struggled with a lot of different things that brought me down. But just because I was born to this Christian household, not everything was right in my heart. And so we're going to go through a process today of seeing what does it take to put Jesus over everything in every situation and so before, before we jump in, I have a process and three steps that we're going to be able to take and we're going to dive into, but I want to show us quickly that this Jesus over everything, it's not just a trendy thing, it's not just a, a passing thing, something that's catchy, but I want to show us the theme through scripture, through a couple scriptures to prove this biblical truth. So John chapter eight, it's not in your notes or anything to look there, but what's going on is the Pharisees in John chapter eight take this woman that's caught in the act of adultery and they throw her at 
Jesus' feet and they have these stones in hand and they're saying, Jesus, what are we supposed to do? The law says this, but, but what do you say? Because they were looking for something to hold against him to say that he was wrong. And in this moment, Jesus is ignoring them and he's just kind of drawing in the dirt. And then he comes up and he looks at them and he says, he who is without sin, let them cast the first stone. It says from the oldest to the youngest, one by one, they dropped their rocks and they walked away. And in this moment, he looks at this woman and says, where are your accusers? And he says, neither do I condemn you. And he sends her on her way. What is this? It's proving that in this sense, Jesus is over the physical situations that happen in our lives when we have no control over what's going on around us, but he has control over that. He's over the natural, he's over this, the physical, but yet also he's over the spiritual state of our lives because she was broken. He could have looked at her and said, you've been through a rough road and I'm not really sure if you're ready for me quite yet. Maybe take a few more days or a couple weeks, but in that moment, it shows that Jesus is over even the spiritual climate, the spiritual state and conditions of our heart and over humanity, that Jesus is over everything. And in uh, Matthew chapter eight, the disciples are with Jesus. And just to prove this point, Jesus is laying, he's taking a nap. He's got his little neck pillow that you take, the little soft ones. He's got a weighted blanket on. He's taking a nap on the boat. And the disciples are like, Jesus, like there's this storm going on. It's rocking. We're gonna die. What are you doing? And he wakes up and he looks at the wind and the waves and he says, peace be still. Just like the song we just sang. And in that moment, everything ceases. And what the disciples say, I love this, is they look at themselves and they say, who is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. Because we see in the previous part of scripture that Jesus is over the, the physical, he's over the spiritual state, but he's also over the elements in and around our lives. He's also over the natural world that we live in because Jesus is over everything. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it says that, Jesus is the mediator of a better covenant, a new covenant based upon better promises. And it says that his blood cries out better things than that of the blood of Abel. And what does that mean? In Genesis chapter four, there was this Cain and Abel, this brotherhood. And one of the brothers, Cain, kills the brother Abel, buries him. And the Lord comes to him later on and says, hey, where is your brother? He asks, am, am I my brother's keeper? And what the Lord says to him is basically, yes. But he's like, don't you know that your brother's blood cries out from the earth to me? And it says in the New Testament in Hebrews, it says that his blood cries out better things than that of the blood of Abel. Where Abel's blood was crying out, I need mercy, I need justice, I've been wrong, I need vindication, I need redemption, I need salvation. In the New Testament, Jesus' blood cries out, I am mercy, I am redemption, I am salvation, I am everything you need because it's Jesus over everything. And in Ephesians chapter one, it says that Jesus is given the name far above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come because it's Jesus over everything. This theme is throughout scripture. And so what I wanna take us on is three steps that we can take in our lives to put Jesus over everything. The first, the first step that we must come to is realization. If you're taking notes, the first step is realization. And this realization could also be said as awareness. And we're going to jump into the, so the story of Saul where he gets converted and becomes Paul in Acts chapter 9 verses 3 through 6. It says, as Saul journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. And just a moment there, because what, is this, what does this scripture mean? It's hard to kick against the goads, because it's something that's in there. But back in that day, there was a long stick that was called a goad. And at the end of that long stick, it had a nail in it. And so when livestock and oxen would swerve off of their course, they'd receive goads from the master who was steering them. And what Jesus is saying in this moment is, Saul, you've been persecuting me. You've been fighting against these goads, but he's saying, you're fighting a losing battle. The more you steer off of the course that I have planned for you, the more goads you're going to receive. The more you go off, it, it doesn't make things easier for you. It makes them harder and more difficult. He's saying it's impossible for you to fight against the goads if you would just fall in line with what I have for you. 
if you would come to this moment of realization, because at this point, Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He would go out and he had orders. He was very zealous and he, for what he believed in, he was very smart and he had a lot of wisdom and he, would, he had a lot of knowledge. But Jesus is saying, I have something better for your life. You've been trusting in your own strength. You've been trusting in your own knowledge. But if you would just let me correct your course of action, if you would come to this moment of realization, you wouldn't have to kick against the goads anymore because I have something better for you. You're fighting a losing battle. And if you're anything like me, I can fall into these traps where I, I mean well and, I do, and, and I'm doing good things and all of a sudden I, I realize that I've overloaded my schedule. And, and maybe I missed a time of prayer or maybe I missed a time of reading my word because I was doing something else and I let things pile up and all of a sudden I see my, my course of action start to steer in the wrong way. And Jesus is saying, if you would just allow me to help you correct that course of action, if we would come to realization or let our awareness be raised, we could steer this thing out because you're fighting a losing battle. Trying to do it on your own will and your own strength is a losing battle. And so what it says was, Saul, so he trembling and astonished. I love that word trembling because it's, it's not a fear like, God, what are you going to do to me? Are you going to punish me? It, what this trembling was, was a reverence, a holy fear, a reverence of God coming before him and knowing I can feel the weight of your presence, the weight of your glory. I, I, I'm starting to put you in the correct perspective. What reverence does is it allows us to put Jesus in the correct perspective in our lives, in the correct perspective in our situations so that we don't take back control. That reverence must be present. And so Saul looks to Jesus. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? I love this question because it's a question of reverence. It's saying, I submit to your lordship. I realize who you are and now I submit to you with reverence. I love this story because Saul goes from being a persecutor of Christians to saying, Jesus, whatever you want, I'll do it. Whatever you ask of me, I'll do it. And so in this moment, we see Saul being kind, kind of converted, but he comes to this moment of realization that I've been trying it on my own strength and I can no longer do this. I can no longer do it on my own. And for me, I, I came to a realization moment when I was my freshman year in, in college and I went to the University of Toledo and I was going for business administration and I was excited about going to school and, and furthering my education. But in this moment, I was, I was having this whirlwind of battles, whirlwind of insecurities. Has anybody else been there where you fight your insecurities, where you fight some of these dependencies that aren't in the right perspective? They don't align up with the will of God, but yet I find myself doing these things because I'm searching in all of the wrong places. I was searching for friendships. I was searching for value. And in that year, I remember coming to this, po this moment, this point in life where I, I went out and I went to a party this evening and I, I ended up blacking out three times in one night. I almost got caught by the cops twice. And in the middle of the night, I came to one conclusion that I can no longer do this on my own. That I've been fighting and I've been struggling and I've been trying to find value and worth, but I can't find it on my own. And I came to this moment where it was almost as if Jesus was saying, it's impossible for you to kick against the goats. I knew there was a plan for my life. I knew that there was something on the other side, but I came to this moment of realization that it has to be Jesus over everything in my life because I tried it on my own and I couldn't quite find it. I couldn't find the way to find this moment of realization that says my awareness has been raised. Now, with Saul in this story, it's amazing how he comes from being such a radical believer and then all of a sudden he converts over to this Christianity thing that he was standing completely against. It's amazing to see how in one moment Jesus changes everything. Has Jesus changed everything in your life? Has he had that moment? Do you remember the moment where you were at when all of a sudden Jesus became really real? That's the moment of realization we're talking about realization must have reverence but the thing is when we come to this moment of realization we can't stay there 
Realization in and of itself is good, but it is not holistic in getting us to the course of action that Jesus has for us. So while realization raises awareness, it doesn't get results. Just because, I'll say it again over this way, if our realization, when we get that raised, when we raise our awareness, it's good, but it doesn't get the results that we need to enable Jesus to be Lord over everything in our lives. In and of itself, realization is not holistic. So where is that in scripture though? Realization raises awareness, but it doesn't get results. In James chapter two, verse 17, it says that faith without works is dead. Realization without any action to it is useless. It's pointless. It doesn't get anything done for us, but we have to allow realization to cultivate my second point here today, our second step, which is desperation. It has to, basically, realization must cultivate or stir up a desperation inside of us. And what is desperation? Because sometimes, I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but you're like, you know what? That guy is real desperate. He'll do anything for a relationship. It's not that kind of desperation that I'm talking about. It can have a bad connotation to it. But desperation is hunger. A better way to even say that is hunger, stirring up a hunger inside of us, a spiritual hunger that says, God, I don't just realize that you're Lord, but I'm hungry to get into your presence. I'm hungry to find out what you have for my life. I'm hungry for things to change because I've been trying to change them on my own and they won't change and nothing's happening. I have a hunger for something more. It's a hunger. And so as we look at Luke chapter eight, verses 43 through 48, we're gonna be talking about the woman with the issue of blood. And it's, the scripture reads like this. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. She came from behind and touched the border of his garment, of Jesus' garment. And immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out of me. This word for power is actually the Greek word dunamis, and it means basically a miracle working power, a power and a, a strength that cannot be man-made. It's not man-fabricated. It's nothing that, that man could do in his own strength or his own might. It's something that's supernatural. It's something that's way above our level of expertise. It's something way above our capability on our own. It's this dunamis power. And Jesus says, I, feel, I felt something going out of me. Because all these other people are just touching him, but he felt faith. He felt a desperation. There was, there was a realization that she came to and a desperation that said, I just need to get to Jesus. Have you ever been to that point where you're like, you know what? There's a lot of things going on and there's a lot of people around me. And sometimes you just got to push past a couple people past you because, you know, I just need to get to Jesus. Because in this situation, in this circumstance, maybe I've been praying for years, but I just need to get to Jesus. If I could get to Jesus, maybe things could change. That's what she's saying in this moment. That's the picture of desperation and of hunger. In verse 47, it says, Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came, here's that word, trembling again. She came with reverence before the Lord and said, In my desperation, I'm going to let reverence match and meet with me because I, I can be desperate for some of the wrong things and my emotions and my feelings at times can sway me this way and that way to be desperate for this or desperate for attention or desperate for a new job or desperate for a new car, desperate for the right looking family and the right property. I can be desperate for all kinds of things, but when my, my reverence meets my desperation, it puts things in the correct perspective. And so she declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I love the statement that, that the Lord makes. He's like, hey, you're healed. Now take my peace with you and go about what you were doing. He's saying, if you have my peace with you, if you allow my peace to come and, and change something on the inside of you, you'll notice a difference in your life. 
that you were, you were trying to do some things on your own against. She's taking and trying to go all these physicians and she spent all of her savings account just to try and get better, was not healed. But in one moment, Jesus changes everything. In our moment of desperation or our hunger, when we reach out and touch Jesus, that's when things change. And I have a couple volunteers that I asked to come up. If you guys would come up quickly. And I have a, as they're coming, I have a picture that I want to show you, a painting that I want to throw up here, that this is the picture. This is what desperation looks like. This is what hunger looks like because this is a painting with the woman of the issue of blood touching the hem of Jesus' garment saying, I need something more than what I've been trying and what happens here is this woman is fighting against everything because just a little bit of the background of, of what would have been going on in this story. This was a woman, and back in those days, if you were unclean like she was with this issue of blood, there was a particular type of clothing that you had to wear that identified yourself as unclean so that people wouldn't have to go around you. And on top of that, you would have to walk around saying unclean, unclean. And so she wasn't clean, and for 12 years, Probably nobody had touched her because she was unclean. Could you imagine 12 years with nobody embracing you? With nobody giving you a hug or a high five or a handshake? Nobody putting their hand on your back? She's been in isolation. She's been in quarantine for 12 years. For some of us, it's hard for two weeks. But 12 years of this is going on, but she reached a moment of realization that I just have to get to Jesus. And, and what she would have been doing is trying to push through the crowd on her own strength of if I could just get, I'm, I'm sure that her thoughts were like, if I could just get to Jesus and talk with him and get face to face and have a conversation with him, then maybe, maybe if I look him in the eye and have a conversation, then maybe some things could change. But all of a sudden she hits this adversity of if I, Jesus, I just need to get to you. Jesus, hey, can you guys get out of the way? and they're like just get back it's my turn and she's Jesus and she slowly comes to this realization that it's not going to happen have we ever come to the realization in our lives that maybe things aren't going to work out the way that we had thought or planned and so I could see almost in this story the picture changing in the woman's mind okay maybe if I can't get in front of him and talk with him eye to eye maybe if I could just like maybe if I could just shake his hand if I, if I could just like I'm desperate I really need him because I've tried everything on my own on my own strength and I couldn't get to him just let me through and she's finding adversity at every turn how many times have we found adversity at every turn in life when we thought things were going to work out, when we thought maybe that son or that daughter or that sibling was going to come back to salvation, but they're not coming back. And every prayer that I make is not seeming to work. What do we do then? And I almost see inside of her where she's like, you know what? I'm not supposed to be here and I'm unclean. Nobody should be touching me. I shouldn't be around this crowd. But there, how many people know sometimes you have to push past some of the people around you? Sometimes you gotta push past the circumstances and say, you might be trying to slow me down, but I'm not gonna allow you to eliminate me from the presence of God. I just have to get to Jesus. And so she gets down and says, I'm gonna kick and I'm gonna crawl and I don't care what people say, but I just have to get to Jesus. Is anybody thankful for Jesus? the presence of God that enables us to come out healed, that enables us to come out restored, delivered with salvation, with the hope in the future. I just have to get to Jesus. I'm convinced, church, that our desperation is hunger, that it can be manipulated at times, but I'm convinced that our desperation inspires revelation. I'm, I'm convinced that our desperation inside of us, the level of our hunger, inspires the level of revelation that we receive from the presence of God, from who he truly is. When I'm truly hungry is when I receive. When I come passively, I know at times when, when I've come passively into the presence of God of like, yeah, I'm just kind of tired. And things have been going on. There's been a whirlwind of things and I'm just, I'm just here. Like I feel like I just barely made it in the door and I'm just here. I remember in, in moments like that, coming in and being like, yeah, that was a good service today. But when I come in with a different perspective of, you know what, Jesus, I've tried things on my own. 
You know, like there's some big situations and there's some big prayers that I've been making. There's a desperation that I have inside. When I come and posture myself in the presence of God and say, God, I'm here for whatever you have for me and I'm not gonna leave until you're finished. I'm not gonna leave being the same. We say it all the time. God, don't let us come into this place and leave the same way. When I come in with that type of desperation, with that type of expectation, that's when breakthrough can truly happen in my life because I'm putting Jesus over everything in that moment. I'm not putting myself in that role. I'm not giving myself lordship, but I'm saying, Jesus, you're over everything. And I believe, and I believe, and I believe that you can do it again in my life. I'm convinced that our revelation will never exceed our desperation. I'm convinced through this that our level of revelation will never exceed the level of our desperation. So desperation is hunger, but our hunger at times, like I was saying, it can be manipulated by our emotions and feelings and lead us down paths this way and lead us down paths that way to where we get to a point where we're like, Jesus, I don't know how I got here and how there's separation from me, but our emotions and our feelings can misguide us. But when we have reverence in the presence of God, it steers our desperation straight to his heart. When we have reverence and we put God in the correct perspective, that's when things change. Now, desperation is good, but we can't stop there either. Realization must come that I realize it's Jesus I need, and I come to this moment of desperation of God, I'll do anything, and I'm gonna push past these other things and these situations, but it cannot stop there. It has to go where desperation breeds. My third point, resolve. Desperation must breed resolve in my life that this reverence must bring something new and something fresh in my life. So we're gonna talk about Paul. We're gonna revisit his life and some of his latter years in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses one through five. Another way that we could say this resolve is confidence. And so the scripture reads like this, and I, brethren, and this is Paul talking, When I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I love in this moment because Paul was Saul, and we read about him earlier, and he was persecuting Christians, and he was doing things based upon his own mind, his own will, his own own strength. And he comes to this point where he, he realizes that it's Jesus over everything. And in his latter years, he comes to this resolve that I don't depend on my own will. I don't depend on my own knowledge. I don't depend on my own strength anymore, my own reputation. I don't depend on me. But I love that he comes to this posture of saying, I'm determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. What would our church look like in America? What would our church look like in the world if we came to this moment and said, I don't need to deal with offenses and let them fester and brew. I don't need to deal with all of the fear that's coming against me in the media and with different things. I don't need to submit to culture and what they're saying I should do and where I should be at at my age or what my family should look like or what my vehicle should look like. What if we came to a point where we said, I don't care about all the heaviness. I just need to get to Jesus. All that really matters is Christ and him crucified because it's that blood by which we're saved. It's that name by which we're saved. We know that Jesus has been given the name that is above everything every name and that he's seated in heavenly places now what if we were able to say as a church that i believe and i submit to the lordship of jesus christ that it's jesus over everything if we get to this point that's when things truly start to change that when we have reverence attached to our realization of who Christ is, when we have reverence attached to our desperation, we're able to stay on course. When we have reverence partnered with our resolve, it drives something so deep inside of us. There was a moment um, a few years ago, I remember I was down at Kingsbury Park here in Defiance. I was doing like a, uh, doing some evangelism. We were going out and sharing our faith with some people and 
and we were inviting them down to this event where we were giving coats and clothes away for people in need and we were, we were doing some all this kind of stuff and I went out to this park and I remember seeing this young man and he was sitting there at the the benches and he had his bicycle laying at his feet he was just kind of looking at his hands he wasn't doing anything and I felt like the Lord was prompting me to go over there and so I was like this is a moment where resolve of who Christ is has to lead me because I could go over there and try and convince him of things in my own strength or my own knowledge I was like I knew in that moment that Jesus really wanted to show him who he was and I remember speaking with him and he told he told me how he didn't really believe in church and he, he wasn't all about that faith stuff and as we're there talking, just opening up in relationship and connecting, there was a resolve inside of me that said, Jesus is Lord even over this guy, even over this son that doesn't see him, that doesn't know him, that doesn't know the truth about who he is. And I remember in that moment going through conversation and this young man ends up finally going from, I don't believe in Jesus Christ to all of a sudden he's crying as we're sitting there and we're talking. And I remember the moment just like it was yesterday because I remember my moment of salvation. I remember when Jesus met me and when things changed and my life was turned upside down. And in that moment, he says, I want Jesus. I know that I, I, don't, I don't really live the perfect life and I don't maybe come from the best family, but I want what you're talking about. And in that moment, this young man gives his life to God and surrenders his life to God. And I believe that God wants to use us in these ways through resolve that we're resolved and I'm fixed. No matter what people say and no matter what it might look like or sound like at Walmart, when, when I feel like the Lord is prompting me, I just wanna be resolved not to be impressive in front of people, but to be obedient to the voice of my Father. I want to be reverent that when He speaks, I say, yes, I'll go, I'll follow, I'll follow your lead. I remember in this moment, I was wearing a T-shirt and on the front, we had it labeled of, of what God had rescued us from. And I remember I, I had put binge drinker on the front of my shirt and it was crossed out. And on the back of my shirt, it said quenched. And I remember looking at this young man, Matt, and he's like, what does your shirt mean? And I was able to tell him how God had saved this son that God had taken this son out of binge drinking and out of low self-esteem and somebody who struggled with identity issues and was swayed back and forth and was kicking against the goads all the time. Jesus was prompting me to say, just come, follow me. There's room in my house, but I kept fighting and fighting and I was able to share with him what God can do with one life who's ready to be surrendered. I'll never forget, we had later that evening, we had an event and I invited him out and he said he would come and I was kind of skeptical. I was like, is he really gonna show up? And I remember he came. And when he showed up, he had taken one of his own shirts and he, he wrote across the front, second guessing, that he always second guessed himself he always second guessed God and, and faith and Christianity. He always second guessed. And in that moment I saw he crossed off the second guessing and on the back of his shirt was resolve. There was a, a resolve that raised up inside of this young man that said, I don't know much about Jesus. I may not know the most about Jesus, but I can still be resolved because I've had a real encounter. So church, we're gonna go back into a moment of worship together. If you would stand to your feet. But in this moment, we've come to a realization that God is more than enough, that he wants to do something in our lives, that he's here, his presence is here, church. And what we're gonna do in this moment is we're gonna let desperation rise. We're gonna let hunger fill the room as we go back into some moments of worship here and we're gonna pray afterwards. But seeing, what do I just need to get hungry for?
What is it that I just need to push past some of the situations in my life? What things do I need to push past so that I can get to Jesus, so that he can do something inside of me that I could not do on my own? He could do something that no substance ever could, that no relationship ever could. I looked and I've searched, but there's something that only Jesus can do. Come on, church, we're gonna go back into some moments of worship. Let's fix every eye on Jesus. Let's fix every eye on him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus over everything. This is your breakthrough. Jesus over everything. is over everything. Jesus is over everything. In this moment, his presence is here. And as we're about to go into prayer, as we meditate back on our lives, where are the areas where maybe I've taken a little bit of control? Where maybe I've, I've raised my awareness and I've been kicking against the goads, the prods that he's been having for me, and I just haven't been paying attention, what are the losing battles that I might be fighting? In this moment, I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is going to reveal to us where those moments are and where those situations are. So would you pray with me, church? And the first group that we're going to be praying for is those who maybe say, you know, I, I want to go through this process, but I haven't even given my life to Jesus. I haven't fully embraced realization of who he is and who he wants to be in my life. Maybe you've never accepted salvation. Or maybe you're a son or a daughter that, that maybe you feel like I've just, I'm not where I should be. I used to serve the Lord, but I've drifted away and I've wandered and, and I'm ready to come back to the Father's house. If that's you, if you would raise your hand in here so we know who we're praying with. And if you're online, if, if that's you and you're saying, I want to accept salvation today. If you either raise your hand in the comments with an emoji or say, that's me. But in this moment, Jesus is here. So if you would pray this prayer with me in your heart, say, Jesus, I thank you for who you are. I thank you that Life change is possible through you. And today I accept the blood of Jesus Christ, the salvation that only he can offer, that only you can provide, Jesus. I accept you today. I believe that you died on a cross, that you rose from the grave in three days, and now you're seated in heavenly places, and I'm seated with you. I ask that you take my life that you take my heart, that you change me, that you renew me because I give you my life. I declare that it's yours today in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. And as we continue praying this morning, if you're in this place and you say, you know what, I, I want to go through this process of realization, of desperation, of resolve. If that's you, 
that wants to go to this place of resolve, but I just haven't known how to get there. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand so we know who we're praying with this morning. If you say, I want to resolve inside of me that cannot be swayed, that cannot be shaken, that says, yes, God, I want more, and I want what you have for my life. If that's you, throw your hand up in the air, whether you're online or you're in the house. Father, we thank you for who you are. You see every son, you see every daughter, and with our hands raised, we give you permission We give you permission to take control of our lives. We want it to be Jesus over everything. Not Jesus over some things. Not kind of over some of the other things that I've I've finally said. But I want Jesus to be over everything in my life. I want him to rule. I want him to reign. So Father God, we we say, here are our hearts. We are open to to receive all that you have for us. We're open to your guidance. And we ask for you to come and change us to come and set a resolve inside of us that cannot be shaken, that cannot be swayed, that cannot be thrown or cast aside. But Father, we're resolved. Whatever it takes to get to Jesus, I'm resolved to know Christ and him crucified. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we give a-